I'm really grateful to be here on behalf of Heart and Mind, sharing this time with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. and Don Jose Ruiz of the Toltec tradition. We are very grateful to have these teachers here to share the wisdom and traditional medicine of the Toltecs. They are both extraordinary authors, healers, um, artists, and uh, really beautiful light keepers for the world. And we are just here to ask more about their tradition and understand what it is that we need to know as a human collective from the Toltec lineage. So welcome, Don Jose, Don Miguel. Don Miguel thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Nicole, for the opportunity. Hope everyone is doing well. Yes, thank you, sister. Very happy to be with you and everybody. So our first question for, uh, for the both of you today is, do we have a um, traditional medicine? What is the traditional medicine of the Toltecs? And can you share about that with us? Well, the most powerful tradition of the Toltecs is respect. That's the highest tool of the Toltec. And the word Toltec, it means uh, artist. It means artist of the spirit. So when we, as artists of life, everything that we see, we get inspired. And, you know, honesty is one of the most beautiful things in life because honesty is the blank canvas. It's that always returns us to the center. But respect, that is the most principal thing because in the Toltec tradition, we find out that our bodies is like Mother Earth's body. It deserves respect. And when we begin respecting, we begin seeing clearly the veils. So what makes us sick in the Toltec tradition, we find out, is the addiction of suffering. And what creates the addiction of suffering? All the lies. And lies are the foundation of hell. So we help heal many people to find their own truth. And it's a feeling, not the words, not wisdom, but it's a feeling of authenticity when you feel grateful to be alive. Then from that, everything is just like a revelation of self. Having grown up with my grandmother, Sarita, she was a faith healer. And my father, was a medical surgeon as well as my uncle who's a surgeon, my other uncle's an oncologist. And we come from a family of healers, both in our tradition as well as in Western culture. I remember witnessing my grandmother they heal and heal so many people in her little temple in Barrio Logan back in the 80s and 90s. And her faith in love and God is what was the instrument that allowed her to help so many people. And when she was able to see someone that needed a little bit of help, she would send them to my uncles or my father for healing. And they, in turn, in their Western medicine practice, when they saw someone who needed that healing that was internal, that of the mind and the heart, of the soul, they would send it over to my grandmother. So they would both be sending uh, people to each other. It was like I grew up watching that uh, duality, that juxtaposition of Western and traditional Toltec, Mesoamerican faith healing coincide with one another, coexist with one another. And when I was seeing that growing up, I felt it was completely normal. As I grew up and watching my grandmother and then practicing what I do, I realized that this great lesson, mm -hmm. we heal with our own permission. Mm -hmm. We the patients, we the people who want help, we use our doctors, our nurses as instruments that allows us to heal us. And that was what my grandmother always says. Faith is believing something 100% and your healing is that instrument that is going to be served by that love. And you have this whole spectrum of instruments that allows you to heal. But always the very first step is I want to live. I want to be healed. I want to love. So that is the lesson that I've learned since those young eight, that te those teenage years when I was an apprentice to them, and seeing all across the spectrum that we heal with our own permission. When someone has post-traumatic stress or, uh, syndrome, they f look out for that thing that resonates with them. When someone is going through some ailment. It is that permission to themselves that allows them to take that first step to find that healing. So for me, the old tradition, as since the new traditions, 
The one constant is that desire to heal. All we need is to remove that barrier that keeps us from healing. And usually that is our domesticated point of view, our conditioned beliefs. You know that for us, as a man, we can say that men, boys don't cry. If we really <laughs> believe in that, then that gentle agreement or condition becomes a barrier to us healing. Mm -hmm. But once we let go of that barrier and we give ourselves that permission, we have a full spectrum of beautiful traditions that humanity has created. And we will find that healing. Beautiful. And would you say that um, the, the faith is fundamental to the healing process and your tradition? Yes. Mm -hmm. Faith activates our intent. And intent is the source of prayer, not what words are being spoken. The words are just, you know, something that inspires us to get our intent out, out of us. When we have that intent feeling, we have something that we place our faith in. And having faith in something, you know, especially having faith in ourselves, that can become so powerful. Why? Because we find an ally, an ally that we've been missing all along. And the ally is not someone outside of us. The ally is within ourselves. That's why the power of faith is so strong when you believe in yourself because you can. And it's not that you're doing something for your personal gain. When we wake up, we know that everything that we give to us, you know, we give to people because we cannot give what we don't have. So when we have that feeling, that calm, that tranquility to control our own poison, our own negativity, our own corruptions, like we say in the Totec tradition, it's time to be skeptical of our own negativity when we wake up. And being skeptical to our own negativity, we can live among the negativity because our source is to bring heaven into hell. We need to bring that comfortableness of loving life in the place where people are living lies, thinking they hate life. They just don't like the life they're living. So the moment that we begin having faith in ourselves, yes, we can leave any abusive relationship. We can leave any abusive thought that happened in the past and not happening anymore. We have to confront the truth. And the truth is to respect ourselves. So when we embrace our own power, our own strength, our own unconditional love, because faith has allowed us to look into the mirror. And imagine when you look into the mirror, but you've never seen a reflection before, but look how loyal it is, that it will follow you to any negativity, any hell, any suffering. When is it going to be our time to wake up and have the faith into that person that's being reflected into the mirror? And that's when I say we find our ally. Because when I'm my ally, I'm my brother's ally. Because I control my poison and I will not corrupt his world with my poison. My poison mm -hmm. dies in me. Mm -hmm. And I respect myself so much and I respect everybody so much that we can resolve any problem that's being given to us. Because if something outside is given to us because we respect it. So we can respect ourselves and have faith like we've never done. 100% believing. Um, I once had a teacher share with me a beautiful lesson. She said, the key to enlightenment is effort. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all she said, and that's the lesson. Since then, I've learned that effort is using the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind, to manifest anything. From ability to take a step, to take an action, to saying yes. That's what effort is. Discipline is remembering to apply that effort every day. That's all that discipline is, just remembering to apply that effort. We don't need that image of the drill sergeant trying to impose onto us what we're supposed to do. It's just this continuous decision to say yes to something. And success is following through on that choice, on that yes. Faith is believing in something 100% without a doubt. It's not about blind faith mm -hmm. or hoping something would turn out. When you put faith in yourself, is you're putting the faith in yourself to have the ability to take a step forward, to animate this body, to animate this mind, to manifest something, to take that step forward, to say yes 
to say no. That if we put our faith in that capability, that ability that allows us to go in any direction in life, effort, discipline, success, these are just words that describe the action of taking steps, mm -hmm. of living life, of engaging life. When we have that faith and that capability, anything is possible because we are the infinite possibility. So in healing and having faith, you know, the, in science they call it the, the placebo effect. Now when you give someone a sugar pill and that person heals, a good, a good majority of people heal, some, some people don't, but a good majority heal because they put that faith in that little pill that allows them to heal. Mm -hmm. Like Jose was describing, you can also put your faith in a pill that makes you feel not so good, not so great, and goes into that darkness inside of ourselves. If we say yes to that, then that faith will take us into a nightmare. Knowing that the word we have, the integrity, the impeccability of our word, is important for us to know what power do we give this placebo effect. And for me, the placebo effect is what gives faith healing its power. Mm -hmm. Life, or you can say, an ability to live and then create. To me, that's what my grandmother taught me. There's no try, like say, like Yoda would say, there's no try, only do or do not. Mm -hmm. So for me, in having that faith is basically saying yes mm -hmm. to that, that ability for us to create and manifest because for as long as we are alive, anything is possible, including healing from the wounds that conditional love left in our hearts. Thank you. I, you've both actually answered my next questions twice in a row. Um, and I am grateful for that and <laughs> not at all surprised. Um, but I do want to, I, I was going to ask you is, is the process similar to the Buddhist concept of right action? And objectively speaking, as I'm listening to you both, you know, this is not just, it's not just the spiritual concept. This is also a science because, or mathematics or music, because you put two things together and they create something else. And, and really breaking down the steps is like, Okay, so we do step one, and then we do step two, and then we use step three, and then we get the result, which is belief in oneself and not faith, that um, self-faith. Um, so thank you for, for that really clear explanation. And um, I wanted to ask you, actually, because that, that kind of concept of... Um, Faith is also present present in the yaki knowledge, and I wanted to ask you both what the relationship is between your tradition and the yaki tradition. Do the lineages come each both of them from the Toltec lineage? Is there something that you can share around that? Well, the yaki tradition is a very beautiful tradition that comes from the north of Mexico. It's basically uh, that from Don Juan from Carlos Castaneda. Mm -hmm. Our family comes from a small town called Juanacatlan, Jalisco, and which is just outside of Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. That's where my uh, grandmother Sarita was born and her father, Don Leonardo, was born and uh, Don Ezequiel Macias was born. Mm -hmm. So in my father's line, in our father's line, that's where we come from. The word Toltec is a Nahuatl word that means artist in English. If I say the Toltec art of transformation in 100% English, it means the artist path of transformation. Mm -hmm. I'm, an art, I'm a Toltec is the equivalent of me saying, I am an artist. And the canvas for my work of art is my life. And the instruments I use to create that work of art, it's going to be my mind, it's going to be my body, it's going to be my heart, this living being that is me. So from that point of view, something that my father always says, Every single tradition in the world has Toltecs, not just in the Mesoamerican tradition, but the European, African, Asian, uh, Oce uh, Oceania as well. 
we all have tall texts and we name them so. In English, it would be artists or artisans. Mm-hmm. And that's what when we call ourselves Toltec. Mind you, there was a civilization called Toltec in Mexico. And that is a civilization that existed in the Valle de Mexico and the outsides in the state of what we now know as the state of Mexico in Tula. Toltecs, according to the old tradition, were also, you can say, they called themselves the descendants of Teotihuacan. So according to that oral tradition, they are the ones who created the, the beautiful city of Teotihuacan, even though we still don't know the, the name or the language they used. So it's all mm-hmm. oral tradition. The only difference is, is that in shamanism, we engage the environment that we're in. It's a communion with the environment we're in. So you can say that the community that my family engaged as, as the Yaqui is unique to the desert or the high plains of Guadalajara mm-hmm. or the, the North Valley Desert in Sonora, the Sonoran Desert in the north. The constant is the human communion with divinity mm-hmm. and the language we use to create and put it into words. So you can say that we, look, we read Carlos Castaneda and we talk, he talks about his allies. Uh, and for me, I go my grandmother, Sarita, my abuelito Luis, and my papa, my Don Miguel Ruiz, and their tradition with, with a, the ally, which is the mind. The mind is both the ally and when it's domesticated, it becomes the parasite. So my grandmother always taught us how to tap into that through that communion of breath and cleaning, because you always believe that if we go into that world and we haven't cleaned this being, this mind, then we're bringing all that stuff into that world and we're just contaminating it from ourselves. But if we do the work and we do the cleansing, then when we get there, it's a beautiful environment. Now, mind you, this is what my grandmother said. And taking that step backwards and looking at the two cultures, it's the version of humanity finding words to express that communion, that aha moment where we heal, where we learned, and we found that step that allows us to understand the environment we are in. So for me, that's how I understand it. Yes, I... It's a beautiful tradition in all the mystery schools around the world, from the uh, Tibetan, the Buddhist, the Jackies, and uh, something that happens in the Totec tradition when we were growing up is the dreaming practices. Mm-hmm. So dreaming practices is a form of meditation where we just like meditate for a long times, but something happens in the meditation. We begin feeling what we really are. You know, we can see our daily lives, what we learn, you know, what we read, you know, what we've been taught. But nothing compares to when you close your eyes and you begin feeling all your emotions. Mm-hmm. You begin feeling that you're alive. You begin feeling a common sense of birth of things. And that's why I feel like from across the world in Tibet, you know, the elders had the same knowledge as the Jackie tradition because it wasn't what they were, you know, collecting in the outside. It mm-hmm. was something they were collecting from the within. Now, when they turn that within and they look into the sky, they found something that's called the infinite. They found the infinite outside of them in the universe, in the skies, in the stars, and they also found the infinite within them because there was no doubt they were made from that stardust. They were made from that elements of light. So they could connect to any point of life. And the most beautiful thing is they found out that we can manifest. We can manifest anything that we dream in dream world. Anything from imagination can imagine, any creativity, any creation from books, from movies, from paintings, from visual town, from a whole world to live, could live in harmony, you know, is being envisioned. So the, the Tibetans and the Jackies and the Totex, we had something similar or one of their main gods was death. Death mm-hmm. teaches us how to be alive. 
and to not be afraid to die and not to be afraid to live it, but to be living in an impersonal point of view. So when we come into a, um, a gathering, let's say different masters got into a gathering into one room, no one's trying to teach nobody what they know. They come in service, honoring one another. And that's the respect that I talked about earlier in the program. If we can learn to respect every artist, every mind, every path, every religion that activates their faith, to get that intent so we can purely manifest from the infinite, you know, it will be a whole different point because the people will be using their energy that has to be coming out because everything that humanity and humans do, it's energy and every, every energy has to find a container. So imagine all those ancient civilization in the Tibet, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Americas, looking up in the sky, seeing all the stars. You know, our elders, our ancestors, my grandfathers, grandparents, already vision what was going to happen right now. We were even talking about how grandmother talked about 2020 being a chaos, but after that we will have a, a first female leader in the world, mm. you know, one of the first, in the, and mother was going to come home. And when she talked about mother, she was not talking about someone's mother, she was talking about our mother, our mother earth, our mm. honoring divine feminism. Even if one is male, they found the feminism in their bodies because their body is part of the my mother earth. So there's common sense. This has been proven in spirituality from the beginning of time. Like first was the word and the word was with God and the word was God because it's creation. So when we can see the mirror of life from the birds, from the animals, from the oceans, from the weather, and we humans have the capacity to shape shift. And that's why in the Tobit tradition, we're shape shifters because we're the mirror people. Mm -hmm. We cannot, act, we have the gift to reflect everything in life. But sadly, we've been reflecting all the negativities, all the wounds, hurting each other, cutting our wings. It's time to honor mother in our body because when we honor mother, we're honoring the doorway, the gate of the infinite, unmanifest to the manifest. And in the total tradition, when we know that you're the artist of your own dream, that you live in your truth, not somebody else's truth, you don't domesticate yourself, but now you domesticate yourself with the things that you love, the, the things that activate the infinite, that activate the best of you, so you can control your own negativity. But yet, something inside of all of us that went into the addiction of suffering, all the negativity that got put into us, I believe it's because something outside, like I said earlier, believed in us that we can transform it into positivity. So we all suffer. You know, there's not a person that doesn't suffer. And it's not about, you know, being competition who has the most suffering in the world of the stories. No, it's that that suffering activated something inside of us. And this is what I felt like our ancestors in Tibet, the Jackies, you know, knew. They knew the, they knew the infinite, mm -hmm. but it's without words. The challenge for the Toltecs that we have, they always say this, is how we're going to express into words what we feel in our heart. Mm. So we're translators. We're translating what's in our heart into our mind, and we're expressing it, and I'm so grateful for what you're doing because you're getting all these different traditions, and we all are honoring the same, you know, creating force, life itself, mm. and remind everybody of their full potential. Thank you so much for that for that reminder that we all have not just an artist, but a healer and our medicine and uh, a gift. And um, I guess a really important question is how to, how do we know when we're, when we've come out of alignment with that respect for the self, for the body, for the heart, for our mind, and what does it look like in our lives when that happens? Oh, I always like to describe uh, the emotional body as an instrument of awareness. Mm -hmm. Our emotions are real. What triggers them may not be real. My emotions are real because I experience them. And they take me in different directions from the full spectrum of love and compassion and joy mm -hmm. to hate and anger and all that stuff that goes with uh, well, not feeling so good. 
I feel all of it. What triggers it may not be real. One can never underestimate the power of planting a seed. That seed may land in one place and it'll take some time for it to blossom, but when it does, it blossoms in a beautiful way. Now, some seeds are full of fear, some seeds are full of love. An example, um, when my son was born over 15 years ago, I was holding him in my hand, in my arms, and I was in complete pure bliss. I was enjoying that communion of holding my newborn baby boy later, three years later, with my daughter as well. But that day with my son, something very interesting happened to me. Mm -hmm. I was holding him in that peace of joy and happiness, just in love, feeling my son in my arms, this brand new newborn baby boy, just maybe minutes. Mm -hmm. And then a thought came into my mind, a belief or a word or expression. It's Southern Infant Death Syndrome. My thought, my mind thought about it, and my son can die of that sleeping. And all of a sudden, all the possibilities that that seed blossomed at the one time, and I went from complete happiness and joy to feeling a fear like I've never experienced fear before. It rocked me to the core because in my arms, I'm holding the one being that I never want to say goodbye to. That's the thing about becoming a parent. You meet that one or two or three or four, whatever, mm -hmm. child that we never want to say goodbye to. It's, it's, it's a love that's intense. Thus, when that little seed opened up, I felt fear like never before. Mind you, my physical body didn't change. My position didn't change. I was still holding my, my son in my arms. All it was was a thought. And it just went, whew. all the articles I read about it, all the story, all that kind of thing. And here's the thing. It's not happening to my son right now. My son is breathing. He's alive. He's in, he's in my, my arms, which means it. All that thing is in my mind. That's what irrational fear does. False evidence appearing real. It took me several months to process this and engage it and heal myself from this. It took me a good, almost a year to really get over it. If, if for most of the parents out there, most of us still have it to a certain degree. You know, it's just one of those things about being a parent. But it, took me some time to take care of it, process it, engage it. What I mean by that is that when that seed blossoms, when that conditioned belief or domesticated belief, our emotional body will react. Mm -hmm. As that moment of truth, I was feeling pure love, pure bliss, joy, happiness. In a second like that, it was gone. And fear and you can say that some people are overprotective of their children because that fear never went away. To a certain belief, it happens enough that some people call it normal. Well, translate that experience into many things in life, from seeing someone you love, meeting someone that you're attracted to, or something happening to our dog, our yogi, something happening to life, elections, uh, COVID, all these kind of things. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And all these events will trigger one of those, blossom, those seeds from blossoming. All right. The reason why I say my emotional body is an instrument of awareness is that when I have that emotional reaction, it exposes a belief. Mm -hmm. I described to you one that was completely in the surface. But there are times when certain events in life 
trigger a much, much deeper, a much, much deeper seed that took root a long time ago and it comes up. To honor myself is to honor this is how, how I feel. This is, I'm feeling this fear, I'm feeling this anger, I'm feeling this joy, I'm feeling this love, the whole spectrum. But what triggered it? And if we're in our journey of discovery, of awareness, that, that moment becomes an opportunity to unearth something that was buried very deep and processing it. It's kind of like a car alarm. If you turn on the car alarm in your car and someone touches it, it goes beep, 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 letting you know that someone touched it, right? Well, our emotional body is exactly the same way. As soon as someone touches a wound, a belief, a conditioned idea, our body will react. Some are based on truth, but many are based on a distorted point of view. Assumptions, lies, half stories, all wounds that we didn't heal. With lovers, you can say that if you someone left you for another person some years ago, and all of a sudden you see certain behaviors in your current beloved, the emotion will rush. Doesn't mean that your beloved is doing it, but now that you have the emotion, that emotion begins to project onto the world and you react in that way. And you're reacting to illusion. So our emotional body, our emotions, give us the opportunity to find when we are not in harmony. How does it feel like when we're not comfortable in our body, when we feel that sadness, when we feel that anxiety? Sometimes anxiety comes because there's a disbalance of minerals in our body or some deficiency. Sometimes it comes from a real exp exposure to a traumatic event and the memory of it makes us go back to that fear. Regardless of which one it is, the ability to recognize this is how I'm feeling, to honor this is how I'm feeling, allows me the opportunity to heal. You see, a moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind, but a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. And that's when our emotions give us that opportunity. So how does it feel like? Well, we're 7.5 billion human beings living life in this very moment, and all of us unique, so that this harmony will look different for all of us. So it all comes down to knowing yourself. How does this feel for me? Do I want to keep it, or do I let it go? And then we start the whole process of healing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like the power of honesty. Mm -hmm. We're honest about feeling a certain way and dealing with dealing it right away, having awareness, not pretending to ourselves. Because what, what's pretending is the ego. I'm not supposed to be feeling this so no one will see it. I'm not supposed to be showing my weakness. No. <laughs> honesty is power. Because honesty will set you free from any kind of illusion that's wrapping you. Honesty will let you know if I'm in a bad marriage, I should get out of this relationship. I try to make it work three times. You know, I'm not here to please anybody else. It doesn't work for me. I'm living in this marriage, not anybody else. You know, people like to be perfect for other people and not knowing what perfect is. They're making this image of perfection, but it is just a hell. It's a lie. But the moment that we're honest with ourselves, yes, I'm dealing with this. And I'm dealing with right now. Why? Because the, the first time that I get irritated, if I don't deal with something that's bothering me, I will be irritated by someone that I love and I will unleash. And then I will feel guilt and shame for unleashing. Then I will become again slave to my own guilt and shame. And it's a cycle of finding heaven and finding it, destroying it, because we're not seeing the problem, you mm -hmm. know? For the longest time, I remember talking about the positivity of life, you know, the things, but there was something still eating me alive that I didn't confront. 
you know, my body got abused, you know, when I was a drug addict. Mm. After that, I just shut it down, you know, I said, okay, nothing to do with it. But I wasn't aware of how it was affecting my uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of how it was affecting my, my nervous system. And, and until I deal with it, the moment that I dealt with it, I didn't care who knew about it. The thing is that I was ready to confront and give it the power away. So let's say personal importance and ego is the one who never wants to be admitting itself and he wears a mask. That's why there's a lot of corruption in spirituality because there's a lot of people who walk into spirituality. Let's say spirituality is a house of, uh, let's say it's a hospital. And people who want searching for spirituality go to the hospital not to get healed, but to pretend to be the doctors. Because pretending to be the doctor, there's no problem with us. Mm. But I tell you one thing: we all human are the same. There's no pedestal to separate us. The person who has more the wisdom in the world and walks it talk, he will still feel the same thing as the person who doesn't walk his talk and doesn't have the wisdom of the world because it's the same emotion. The moment that we begin using the words not to hurt ourselves, but to use it in our behalf is because we're not afraid of being honesty in each other, the third agreement. Do not make assumptions. Do not be afraid of communicating what we're feeling inside. If we're having this imagination of this, you know, victim mind that got abused by having a lot of relationship of mistrust, mm -hmm. instead of going to talk to this person, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Or what's happening? Because I feel this. The person can add up all these infinite ideas that are not real and you know over those ideas that are not real they'll make a decision based on lies and that will hurt what's happening in the right now moment of any kind of life that's why when we're honest and we're not happy it's okay because the first rule of the art of happiness is that we're not happy all the time when we get that awareness we can calm the body down we can do all the ceremonies the rituals you know, we can pick up a book, we can do practice, we can walk, we can train, we work out, whatever, make us to not think. Because when we stop thinking, we let the problem calm down. It's not, we're not putting firewood into the fire. But if we're not honest about what's happening in our bodies, in our minds, how can we even heal? And that's the power of thing of honesty. Okay, I feel off. I said, okay, today I feel off. You know, I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with that. Don't take me personal. And one thing that our father teach us is he said to us, when somebody screams at you, when somebody says these awful words to you, don't take them personal. Why? Because if you look behind the words of poison, they're asking for help. Mm -hmm. And then when you look into the big picture of the world, people are asking for help. But the egos, the personal importance, will not let certain people ask for help because of how they want to be seen. I tell you, sister, in humanity, we all fall sooner or later. And mm -hmm. I will fall too. And I don't doubt that you will extend your hand to pick me up and that you will extend you pick me up. And my puppy will fix me up many times because, you know, <laughs> the puppy doesn't care to you. He just gives me that love until my, 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 my storyteller comes down and mm -hmm. I feel the truth. And that's the beautiful thing about feeling the truth. We can express it. If we don't feel it, we don't want to admit that we can never express it and our life will never change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're changing constantly because life is about changing. But mm -hmm. if we get comfortable in the uncomfortableness and, and then we don't do it no more in our life, we get comfortable in uncomfortableness for one situation, we stay, we stay in one yoga pose for the rest of our lives. <laughs> you know, we're getting used to an opinion that we're used to. We're only dealing with certain things that we're used to. And anybody who has a problem, we cannot just tell them the same thing. <laughs> when we are being honest with ourselves, we will taste and experience many things of life, many up and downs. But there will come a moment where we overcome ourselves and we're strengthening again. Like right now, I remember getting my strength back. I let the world of crystal met a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing some, some courses. And when some people are trying to recover from crystal meth, you know, I have a message to give them. Why? Because I've been there, mm -hmm. you know, we've all been there for one point or the other. So our suffering in the world of addiction, of suffering was not in vain. It was preparing us in the big university of life. And we're all not the same. We all come from different points of views. But what helped us to reach this point is to feel honest. And when we're honest, believe, you know, believe me, we know when we're off.
We're not when we're off center. When we're trying to make excuses and justification why we did that, we're even even more deeper. And that's when my grandfather used to say, now that you do that, then catch yourself putting your lip more. <laughs> he already did, but then even harder. Mm -hmm. But that's how we learn without judging ourselves. If we didn't do that, how we will learn, you know? If we didn't go into an abusive relationship, how we will know what an abusive relationship it is? Mm -hmm. we're, we're so tough in ourselves because we're addicted to suffering. We get the one thing and hurt ourselves for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Time to let those things go and free. And that's why I believe in resurrection in the same life because we were dead once in life. And like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Jackies, you know, we were dead once, now we're back in life. It's like we went to a wake and we saw our body there. Now, every problem that we had, every wound that we had, it got burned. It's not there anymore, but we have the memory of it. And it's always there lurking to us to recreate it. And you know why it can be recreated? Because we're powerful. And the sad thing is that we're not being aware that we're giving it to our children. Mm. When we get aware of that, that our world is contagious, that we're contagious, positivity or, or negativity, we're contagious beings. Mm. Then we choose what we, our message is going to be from now on. But the services never end because, you know, we're Adam and Eve. We hold the male and the female energy within us. We taste the apple, but no one kicked us out of our own heaven, of our own garden. We did it ourselves. And we're doing it every day, just like a scorpion that stings itself with its own stinger. It's time to stop stinging ourselves with our stinger, with our mind. It's time to return heaven and to not bite the apple, which is a metaphor of the dream that we continue chewing. It's like, if I want to stay in that abusive relationship, why do I want to continue staying in that house? And we break up, why do I want to call that person again to come back? It's time to not chew that apple. It's like a bubble gum. We begin chewing it, it has flavor. After a week, it lost its flavor, and it hurts our jaw, and we continue chewing a flavorless dream. It's time to put that out. And that's how we become aware, because we begin telling us the truth. This gum has lost its flavor. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hearing you say, basically, you know, that it is that the internal work. You know, as you were saying, no, no, say, no, and I like that. It's, it's protecting the other person from the poison that's inside by doing that internal work, that confrontation, and you know, making sure you take the necessary steps to keep yourself in your alignment and harmony, um, which I think is universal, universal teaching, universal knowledge. And um, I'm curious about your, your line, your Abuela Sarita, your father is the eagle line of the Toltec tradition. And I was just wondering what, what are some of the different lines there and how does that manifest in the work that an individual or family will do in the world or within the tradition even? There's the, there's the Jaguar line, the eagle line, basically lines that were always reflect the power animal for a tradition. You can say that in doing your own personal journey, for example, let's 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 do this. When you have that awareness, you begin to look at yourself. You can say the modern word would be you look you begin to look for triggers. What triggers you? For example, what triggers me to take things personal? What triggers me to make things assumptions? What triggers me to domesticate other people? What triggers me? So in order for that to happen, I begin to look at myself internally. So it's not just about recapitulating. It starts being about, okay, now that I'm aware of this, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to pay attention to when I do it. I can go back and think about the times that happened, but most of the times we gloss over what triggered us, what happened, you know, the, what was the... Uh, What's the word of uh, um, the precedent? What was the precedent before that action? Mm -hmm. Precedent. Yeah. So going forward, you begin to pay attention to your actions. At that point, the concept of the hunter comes in. The image of the hunter that pays attention 
or stalks its prey. In mm -hmm. this case, the prey is what triggers me. You can do it from a point of view of an owl that sees everything from afar is silent and is a witness to everything that's doing. And in the moment, in the right moment, it swoops in. The jaguar howls and moves. And in the moment when he begins to sniff that there's something, a prey, something to eat, he slowly moves slowly and he pays attention. And then he witnesses for that opportunity and strikes. A spider puts up the web. And in that web, you know, the spider comes back and sits back and waits for the fly to get trapped. The wolf hunts in a pack and you do it as a, as a group. You look for that, that prey and once you find it, you scatter around and you work as a group to get that. The hawk looks everything from afar, is constantly swooping down, walking around, and once he sees it breaks, it goes around in circles and it goes and so on and so forth. So a lot of the lineage goes from that point of view of how one develops the discipline mm. to control their own intents. Mm. Uh, Jose talks about the honesty, the, you know, there's the discipline of being honest with themselves. You can say that, let's say, someone is always being honest with themselves and recognizes that, for example, I take things personal. I stop pretending it's something I am not. I'm Miguel Ruiz Jr. Do take things personal. Do make assumptions. I'm sometimes not impeccable with my words. Sometimes I'm not skeptical at all. Sometimes I don't do my best. Just ask my wife. She's my witness. There's the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not and I accept myself for who I am. So in those moments, being honest, like Jose was describing, becomes a discipline. This discipline of being honest with myself, I take things personal, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I accept that I take things personal. But then life has given me the opportunity to practice not taking things personal. At that very moment, if someone posts something on Facebook or someone says something or someone, whatever, could be whatever instance you can imagine that sets you off. At that moment, we have a choice. If we take it personal, it's because I want to take it personal. That's fine. But in that moment, I also have the choice how not to take it personal. I'm free to say yes to either one of these choices, and that's what personal freedom is. I say no to taking it, not taking it, sorry, I say no to taking it personal because it comes with a hangover that I don't want to experience. Mm -hmm. So I, yes, I, say, I say yes to not taking it personal. I had to take, keep that in order there. <laughs> I want the consequence that comes from that. In order for me to even get to that point of being able to choose at that very moment, it requires that discipline of paying attention to myself, of hunting my triggers. So when I know the patterns, I know the action, I'm able to recognize it when it's here. So different paths, different ways of going about it. You can say a uh, spirit animal who says really good about that. Uh, you can say different form of stalking, you know, form of like learning how to control your intent and pay attention. Um, the form of the hunter. Now, mind you, these animals hunt because they're feeding. That's why they hunt. They hunt to be fed. Mm -hmm. So, if you add that element to our hunting practices, what am I eating? What am I saying yes to? Mm -hmm. What are the triggers that I am nurturing myself with? And what I mean by that what am I saying yes to? My self-judgment that I don't have hair like Jose does. My ability to judge myself for not looking like him. Because I can use that domestication. I can judge myself because I can use that image of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. to judge myself, to domesticate myself with. But that image of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. doesn't exist. 
the thing that makes the, that judges me to my brother, that doesn't exist. We're both as unique as we both are. What am I feeding myself with? What am I saying yes to? In essence, Jose teaches about angel training. What kind of messenger are you? Mm. So Jose, as you can say, described another form of hunting, the way of the angel. What kind of messenger are you? What are you saying yes to? Jaguar, owl, mm. eagle, snake, scorpion, wolf, yogi. All yogi has to do is give us that look and like, all right, let's keep on something. <laughs> He's learned how to say something. And the distance you can hear Punky saying, I want attention, I want attention. Mm. All right, so what are we saying yes to? What are we giving our attention to? So for me, as far as how I've learned about the Eagle Knight lineage, it comes from that ability to have the discipline to be a witness mm. and pay attention to this skill. Of course, there's also the Jaguar Knights and many, many others. What's that? Yes, there's three attentions in the Totec tradition. The first attention is the dream of the victims. The second is the dream of the warrior. And the third is the dream of the angels. So for the longest time, I lived in the world of the victims, in the snake, couldn't control my poison. I bite and they bite me back and always hiding in darkness until I begin to see myself as I live, have the epiphany. Now I go into the world of the warrior, the second attention. In the second attention, it is the dream of the jaguar. Why? Because it's going back and forth. It's going back to the world of the victim and back to the warrior. Then, after you know, mastering oneself, after mastering love, like Father explains, and my brother mastering itself, you be do all the tools that happen in life to release all the lies and go back to the truth. And the truth is about honoring Mother Earth in the body in the jungle. So, from that point of view, they go into a vision quest. And the vision quest is to follow the guide, the spirit guide, and that's the dream of the Eagle Knight lineage. Because the Eagle Knight lineage sees from above. It sees the creation from above. This is the point of view. But you know, it's easy to talk about it, to see it clearly, but then it sends the Jaguar. And the Jaguar is the one that's feeling the emotion. It feels the jungle because its action is to take care of the jungle. And for the Jaguar Knight, our mind is the jungle. Yeah. This is where we survive. And we're in survival mode all the time. But we have the memory of the first attention of the dream of the snake. And I remember in one of the beautiful meditations that I had, I was the Jaguar Knight. I was aware of the Eagle Knight. They're, I'm in service to them because they gave me all the tools to change my life. But I don't forget where I come from. Mm -hmm. But in one of my meditations, I saw the Eagle coming down and circling around a cactus tree. And then he dove down and he grabbed the snake and he grabbed the snake, he put it down and it landed on the cactus tree. And that's where the eagle began devouring the snake. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was the old metaphor of the old Asian vision questing. It was wherever you find the truth devouring your lies, you are at home. And this is the gift of the eagle knight lineage to always be aware that the truth is always the light that will overcome the darkness and that it will bring healing to any part of life. So the artist has become the healers because we're healing with art. Because if they even say it in these times, in these modern times, what kind of healing arts do you practice? Mm -hmm. Because it arts about getting out of that head, out of that mentality, out of that victim world. And the Jaguar will never forget where it comes from in the story. but. Mm -hmm. The eagle, night lineage, always remind us that everything is just a story. Good things, bad things, everything is just a story, but what we are is life. Now imagine knowing that we are this life, incarnated into this body. What a gift. We can see the little angel holding the Virgin Guadalupe, or we can see the tiger ushering the divine Indian goddess in its back, carrying her. It's our strength, it's our will, how give us strength to take care of the love of our life because that's our mission as angels. This is the love of our life. And when I take care of my love of my life, 
I can take care and be in harmony with my brother in the love of life. That's why when I say when masters get together, they're not trying to compete who has the best knowledge, the best stories, or who you know, has the more like in the internet. No, they don't care about that. They care about working for the same boss. Mm. That's why grateful to be working for the same boss. And you know, that's why it's about integrity. When we find out that we all are really the Eagle Knight lineage, it's because we're all working from that point of view. And what I say Eagle Knight lineage right now is just uh, to name it something that it can be named into many things. And this is the most beautiful thing when we know that we are alive. Mm. And Father says we can be called spirit, energy, you know? We don't know. The only thing we know is that we are alive. And here we are now, sharing it to the ones who are ready to wake up. And the only thing we have to do is just taking care of our garden, mm. the jaguar. Thank you so much for that um, journey and understanding and um, the symbolism that is a living symbolism um, because we're experiencing it in all moments of our lives. And I um, I wanna honor your time again. We're so grateful that you're here with us. And I guess I have uh, one last question for each of you um, stemming from, you know, different interviews that I've heard your work, things that I've been studying with and connecting to. Um, so Miguel, I heard you say, you know, that you were a witness to your father coming into his, his power, you know, his gift. And you remember when he was just Miguel, and then you remember when he was Don Miguel, and that entire process that happens is so alchemical. And as you both just said, and you said, um, Don Jose, that we're at this time where so many people are waking up, and that's who you're speaking to and speaking for. And in a way, that's also the boss, or maybe that's the only boss who knows how it works. But, um, you know, just thinking about for us, you know, because you, you're you coming, you're inside of a tradition that teaches you how to manage that energy as it's, as it's opening. And there's a lot of people that are isolated that there's a lot of families or communities that don't have the training to support the rising consciousness or awareness blossoming of an individual. And I'm curious, to you, Don Miguel, how, how to deal with that as an individual and then how to, how to maybe become more aware as a person who might be witnessing something really special happening and become more supportive? Sure. I only control to the tips of my fingers. Mm. I don't control beyond it. I don't control, for example, my, my brother. I only control to the tips of my fingers. I don't control his will. I don't control his perception. He does. To respect him is to respect his capability to say yes and no to things he wants to say yes and no to. That's for me to respect. That's how I respect him. His no is just as powerful as his yes. I can't give what I do not have. In order for me to give him that respect, it starts within myself. My no is just as powerful as my yes. My yes and my no. I only control my own will and my own intent. It's that inner journey within myself to heal that relationship between me and me. If I'm the voice that's talking inside of my own mind when I'm thinking, who's listening? I am. If I'm the one who's listening, who's talking inside my own mind when I'm thinking? I am. If that relationship is in harmony, then all my relationships are in harmony. But if that relationship is in disharmony, then all my relationships will be in disharmony because I am the constant in every relationship that I am in. So I do the work. And like you described, I witnessed my father be, be Dr. Miguel Ruiz, so Apprentice Miguel Ruiz, and Don Miguel Ruiz. I, I watched his own process. And in, within me, I, I remember Miguel, Mikey, I remember Apprentice Miguel, and I'm and experiencing who I am now. I can only control to the tips of my fingers, which means I am only responsible 
for my own growth, my own evolution, but I'm able to help. I teach with permission. That's something that I've learned throughout my workshops. I remember when I was young, when I first started working, my whole goal was to keep everyone in their seat because people always, you know, with people getting up and leaving, you never know why. And then one day I, it, I realized, you know, someone left and then I'm looking out and that's the person who's giving me their attention. So I'm going, that's it. It's not about me focusing on keeping everyone's. I'm engaging those who give me permission to teach. Mm. And that's important because if I were to be in a restaurant and all of a sudden I sit down and I start teaching, that's not going to go anywhere because they didn't give me permission to teach. It could be the same person on the same night, but if they're in the restaurant or in, in, the, in the venue, in one place they gave me permission and the other one they didn't. We give ourselves a permission to learn, which, which comes from a beautiful expression from my wife. My favorite expression quote from my wife, which goes like this, Miguel, you're my husband, not my teacher. Means my aunt said she didn't give me permission to teach her. I am her husband. That kind of mm -hmm. thing is. This, this comes from me trying to teach her Spanish. She got she got a little frustrated with me saying uh, this word means this, but it could also mean that. It could also mean this. It could also mean that. Because you know, words have even in Spanish they work different in different places. Mm -hmm. It reminds me so much with my children. You know, with like teaching them the tradition comes with their permission. It's the same thing with everyone. So that image of being the only sober person in the party where everyone else is drunk. Imagine being that only person. You're talking to two people. One has been nursing their drink for hours. Meaning like that is like they have the same cup and once in a while they take a sip, which means they're barely, barely intoxicated, if at all. Next to that person is a person who's opened their third or fourth bottle and they blacked out, but they're still functioning. It's impressive to see such people. Everyone in the party is somewhere between them. Now, juxtapose or translate that into everyone's in their different stage of evolution or different stage of awareness or different level of attachment. Then all of a sudden you realize that everyone's in their own unique place. Some person that you're speaking to, they're the same person, and then they have a second or third, and as the drinks come, they, their personality changes right before, in front of you. Mm -hmm. Then they stop drinking, and all of a sudden they start sobering up, and their personality starts changing in front of you. Well, every person in your life, there's in different stages. Now, how to help them? I will only be able to help them with their permission. Mm -hmm. People read our books, not because I force them to, it's because they're interested. They give me permission to share my tradition in the form of a book, a form of presentation, even with your audience. People are listening to us because they're giving us permission to talk to them through their attention. I'm not forcing them. Here it is the information. If you take it, great. If you don't take it, great. If it's resonant, if it resonates with you, great. So you control your own up and down. You control your own levels of evolution or levels of attachment. Some days something happens in the life, boom, you know, there's activism and this all this emotion and anger. Then all of a sudden comes and peace and boom, you know, it, 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 it's all nice and somewhere between. We're always up and down, you know. If we if, if we were a lotus flower of a called awareness, we're always going up and down our our awareness. You know, sometimes we're completely open, sometimes we're closed. If you have that and you see that in yourself, then you're able to recognize it with everyone in your life. Everyone's in different stages. Knowing the difference between compassion and pity. Pity mm. says who are you? You can't do it for yourself. Let me do it for you. At that moment, you're not really respecting that person. Even if they're having a problem, you're not respecting them, even though you help them. You're not really respecting them. Compassion 
is saying, I know you can do this yourself, but here's my hand if you need my help. But I know you can do it. I know you can do it, but here's my hand if you need my help. That's difference. Pity says, who are you? Let me do it for you. I don't think you can do it. Compassion is, I know you can do it, but if you need a uh, helping hand, here I am. And there's a the difference. How to help people in society. How to help the people in our life. My dad always said, if you put your nose where it doesn't belong, it's going to get broken. It's something my father said over and over us. And as, a, as time progressed, I first, when I first heard it, I thought, I thought it was kind of pretty rash. But as time progressed and I understood what compassion is, respecting someone's capability of handling things is very important because it respects their story, their being. But if you're there and you know how to help them, allow them to know that that option is there. And usually they will know by the way you live your life. You know, I've, I've had friends come up to me and says, Miguel, you look so happy. How did you do it? And I'm happy to share. And what happens, it's sharing. I'm sharing what worked for us. And you see a lot of teachers out there, what they're sharing is how they healed themselves from conditional love, from wounds, from a dark places. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty impressive. Thank you. you know, it's very mm -hmm. contagious. <laughs> when we work in ourselves, it's very contagious because we begin being like the hummingbird. And the hummingbird in the old tradition was the messenger of the gods. And why do we mean hummingbird? When we work with ourselves, when we are just in our center, we get that nectar. And let's say we go to the coffee shop and send that love to the barista, to the groceries, you know, to when we get into a car, we're getting that nectar, you know, instead of doing the opposite and corrupting the hummingbird's path. Because imagine if we get the hummingbird's path to collect the nectar, what well, gossip, envy, jealousy, hatred, and begin talking to you know, to other people about what other people are doing. And that creates, you know, such disharmony at first. It begins, you know, uh, and then it kills the integrity and you can feel something poisoning it up that we know that we're misusing the, 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 the hummingbird's path. When we begin honoring the hummingbird, we begin honoring ourselves because we will not have an, a language of negativity that we're leaving because it comes to the respect you know, the four agreements and all the other Totec books, it's a mirror of integrity. That's why many, many people really go, I know this information, or I feel like this book just was made for me. It's because it activates our integrity. And then we read it again, we feel like we're reading a different book, but it's the same book. It's the same book, the one who has changed it is us. So we're always an inspiration wherever we go. But when we judge, ourselves we put ourselves down we don't look at that because we put ourselves down and that's sub, 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 submitting ourselves mm -hmm. doing suppression about ourselves and this is what happened to the divine mother when we begin suppressing ourselves as human beings we're suppressing the divine mother it comes a point where we really want to support the divine mother in our body and the first thing to do is to not suppress ourselves any longer to hear a voice like that quote that they say in the in the world right now you know, speak, even if your your voice shivers, you know, even if you feel shaking, if your body shakes, just have your voice because it's your voice that is being a message delivered. It's the power of our intent behind that voice that we're saying, that word becomes powerful and impeccable because it becomes a seed into life. Let's say <clears throat> we work with ourselves, we're in line someplace, and then someone says, you know, I see many people saying hi to you. You know, what are you doing? Well, you know, I make this work. Oh, I make this work too. And all of a sudden, you were in the right place at the right time to deliver a message. And the only thing you had to do is be you. And that's why I say to everybody, when we work with ourselves authentically, honestly, we're creating this energy. We're creating this energy that coming out of us. We're purifying our intent mm -hmm. because now we want to be 
respectful to ourselves what we want reflected into our lives and what we don't. Because if we want to find for injustice and negativity, it's out there. But the thing it is to overcome it and walk on fire without being born. And this is when we find our own healing words and our faith in ourselves. That is the medicine. And this is the totec medicine that we're sharing with everybody. The medicine to purify your own words. So like any other, you know, powerful woman in our tribe, they used to get the herbs. And from all different herbs, when they make their walk, they create this medicine, this tea, you know, to, to heal the tummy or this thing for the eyes. You know, our elders, they knew exactly what to go into the, into the, the nature to pick four plants. Now it is become even massive. You know, it gives me big, big, big happiness to go to the groceries and to see my grandmother's tradition in a juice bar. Because they get all those things, that the ginger root, all those things that you used to use for healing, they're in the groceries. And I say, oh my God, if grandmother was here, she would be laughing with me because I would tell her, you know, grandma, when you said divine mother was coming back anywhere without knowing when she was going to come back, I never expected to be in the supermarket, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's beautiful that it's coming out everywhere, especially in the world leaders, because this is what we need for. You know, we're always been we always been in need of mother love. And when we took that away as humanity, we suffered. You know, the bees, the ants, they support their queen. And we humans, it's the same thing with us. The more we're honoring mother, our sisters, you know, our, our spouses, you know, we're honoring the divine goddess. And divine goddess is the divine mother in the flesh. It's time to return to our roots. And it's time to end the war of the gods because we're at the tip end of it of a war that was from the beginning of the world we're mm -hmm. at the end of the world of the wars we're at the end of the world of the gods in the world competition see all the different traditions right now united mm -hmm. united to overcome any negativity that's coming up because right now the time of feeling will begin because now is the time to you know pick all the flowers and make the most beautiful bouquet and give it to the divine mother in the altar and the most beautiful thing is that all of us are a flower so all of us united we're giving it to the divine mother and you know who's going to be watching this beautiful ceremony the little ones because the past tried to resurface and live it didn't survive and it will not great <laughs> thank you so much for that um really powerful message and really clear and i like the way that was framed that we're um we're at the end of the war of the gods and um really unifying now obviously it's the mission of the heart and mind and it's all of the pieces working together um to bring all of the wisdom for and out. And um, we're really grateful to you both. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your father, for your grandmother, for all of your relatives and their tradition and walk on the planet in the service of humanity. Um, we would love to know, maybe I'll, I'll email. Thank you to Natalie too for arranging this because there's always the people behind the scenes and we deeply acknowledge them as well. Um, for what your, um, what causes are important to you, how we can help spread the word about certain causes that are important to you and let people know about things. So I'll reach out to her and ask so we can include those links here. Um, again, have a beautiful uh, day, have a beautiful week. Uh, thank you so much for your time, for sharing about your tradition, about the Toltec tradition, about your, your individual paths and your individual medicine. And um, we hope to connect with you again sometime. Thank you so much for this beautiful opportunity, Nicole. I hope you have a wonderful time. Thank you so much to everyone in attendance. Hope you have a wonderful time as well. Thank you so much for giving us the permission to share our tradition with you. Oh, thank thank you. you. And remember, we all work for the same boss. 
and we are sure to make a masterpiece of art with our lives and share it together. And thank you for what you do, sister, for this opportunity. We're so grateful. Our love and respect and gratitude. Mm -hmm.